Well, good afternoon, sports fans. Uh, I'm so glad you're able to join us. My name is Chris Harwood. I'm the lecturer in Czech uh, here at Columbia University and also co-director of the East Central European Center. Uh, and I'm joined uh, by my co-director, Alexander Boskovic, and uh, our guest speaker today. I'm very glad you can join us uh, for the uh, uh, this Istvan uh, Dayak professorship talk. Our guest is Karlin Röde. Uh, who will be the Istvan uh, Deag Visiting Assistant Professor of History at the Harriman Institute. Uh, and she is simultaneously a visiting postdoctoral fellow at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. Uh, recently, uh, in 2016-2017, she was visiting lecturer at Mount Holyoke College. Uh, and she is a, a broadly trained environmental historian with a, a transnational approach to the histories of Central and Eastern Europe, including the Soviet Union. Uh, and her current book project, uh, Engaging with Transnational Questions of Sport, Technology, Environment, and Politics, uh, explores the internationalization and sportification of recreational climbing in the 20th century. Uh, and um, also, so she will be here as a visiting professor in the summer A term, the, the, sum, the first half of the summer term. So I would just like to share uh, with... Um, uh, hold on a moment with our uh, uh, Columbia audience. If you or any of your students are looking for courses to take during this summer term, I'd just like to uh, give a shout out for them. Uh, and so uh, these are the two courses that Carolyn will be offering. Uh, Modern Balkan Histories, which is uh, available to both graduates and undergraduates. Um, uh, which will uh, look at Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Romania, and Albania in the 20th century, uh, looking at themes such as state building, war and violence, living dangerously, economy, uh, nationalism, and global entanglements. And as the format for many of these uh, intensive uh, six weeks courses is for three hour sessions, she's going to uh, keep that interesting for students and sustainable uh, by combining discussions of course readings, uh, in-class primary source work and screenings and discussions of film. And uh, the other course, which connects pretty closely to her topic for today, uh, is Sport and Society in Eastern Europe, also available uh, to both undergraduate and graduate students. Um, this is going to look at the history of 20th century Eastern Europe, including the Soviet Union through the lens of sport. Uh, and it's going to explore the rise of athleticism and mass sports in the context of state building and East Central Europe. Uh, it's a fascinating topic, which we're going to get a, a, an insight into from today's talk. Uh, so again, if you are a Columbia student or you are uh, an instructor of Columbia students, please uh, make a note of those. Uh, and so without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Karen Röde. Thank you so much, Chris, for the introduction. Ray, glad to be here. I mean, in the ether between us and here um, at my work desk, but I'll be very soon in New York. And I'm very glad this is finally happening. That's wonderful. And um, yeah, I'm going to share my presentation with you. We did have a, let's see if we are at um, just a second. So let me just stop for a second. For some reason, this does not want to work as it just did a few seconds ago, as always. Now I'm missing the... All right. This is so sad. <laughs> Okay, can you? So now I can't see anymore. Um, may I ask, Chris, do you see the correct slide? Yes, we, we see. You uh, do. It looks like your title slide. Wonderful. Okay, because I just lost seeing you and everyone else. Um, so when climbing became competitive, how Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union sportified a vertical space. 
And we're going to start right in, well, Tokyo 2020, or rather 21. Well, in August 2016, the International Olympic Committee officially confirmed five new medal disciplines for the Tokyo Olympics that were supposed to take place last year, but postponed into this year because, well, we all know why, because of the unspeakable. And among those discipline is also climbing or rather a combination of three different climbing disciplines. So we have elite climbing that is resembles um, mostly the um, traditional climbing as you might think with a rope going up a high wall and um, here you score the higher you get on a difficult route. And then there is bouldering that's climbing on a short wall that's only three to five meters tall uh, but the problems to climb are very difficult. And lastly, there is speed climbing and speed climbing works on a normed route. The holds are always the same since 2005 and competitors race up these holes and there is a buzzer at the end of the route and you hit the buzzer and that's how your speed is measured. So you think, what does all this have to do with the Soviet Union and or Eastern Europe? Well, as I'm going to tell you in the next half an hour, competition climbing and particularly speed climbing is something originally generally Soviet. And it was something that was rejected and loathed by many Western climbers in the post-war period as an absolutely absurd activity driven by ideological obsessions. And the inclusion of climbing into the list of Olympic disciplines, and that's my point here, is a late victory of the long gone Soviet Union and its sport officials. And in fact, the emergence of formalized climbing competitions as such originated in the Soviet Union. And we could say that this like sportification of vertical spaces into Olympic spaces is a story one wouldn't necessarily say of Sovietization of climbing, but it's a story of Soviet influence on Western practices and thought worlds. And Eastern Europeans had a mediating role in the story that I will also touch upon. So, until the mid 1980s, competitive climbing was practiced only in the Soviet Union, including some Eastern European states, in particular Bulgaria. And why and how does that, did that came along? So in 1947, and I don't have a picture of 1947, but of 1972 of this Bizengi mountaineering camp, the uh, director of a neighbored one actually, Dombai in the Western Caucasus, um, wondered how he could bring his rather unfit climbing instructors into shape. And um, a note on these camps. So the Soviet Union trained people interested in climbing and mountaineering in these um, mountaineering camps. That was the infrastructure um, that um, was, uh, both on the Pamirs and in, in the Caucasus, um, you could get a spot in these camps and stay there for a few weeks and take various courses in climbing and mountaineering. And here you see a picture of the climbing instructors um, being trained as well um, from the later 1970s. So somehow his climbing in instructors were not really fit. And so he decided to appeal to their competitive nature and he organized a climbing competition. And it took only a week that the neighbored uh, camps took uh, upon this idea, emulated it, and also organized their competitions. And only a year later already, there was a Caucasus championship in climbing. And in uh, 1955, there was already an all union championship um, that took place in Yalta in three categories, speed. So something that I mentioned and previously is also now an Olympic discipline, and then also individual and rope teams. 
And then there was a 10 year break and another competition um, organized in 1965 and from there on more regularly. And here are a few pictures of that championship in Yalta. And as you can see, it entails all elements you also know from other climbing competitions. You have a poster inviting spectators to come and watch. You have, of course, the activity here and um, also an award ceremony. And so these were competitions in rock climbing. But since the 1960s, there were also organized competitions in high altitude mountaineering. So, um, you know, mountaineering, when you think of the climbing in uh, alpine environments on mixed terrain like rock and ice, um, in steep snow slopes. So even in those kinds of environments, the Soviet Union organized competitions. Um, and there were different categories. There were technical climbs. So technical, it means that um, it was more than just walking up a high uh, steep um, snow slope, but you really had to climb and use protection and so on. And then there was a category mountain traverses. That means, for example, you would get up the um, east buttress of uh, one mountain and then down um, the west ridge. And also there was a category of high altitude climbs above 6,500 meters. And so you had to qualify for these competitions by taking certain courses in these mountaineering camps. And then you would earn a badge, Mountaineer of the Soviet Union, and this badge had different grades, grade one, two, three, and then you would move up the ranks. And then you could take part in provincial and the lastly USSR championships, so all union championships. And there then you could earn points towards the rank of a master of sport. And this master of sport rank also existed in other sports disciplines that was not um, something particular to climbing. Um, and so the reason why this whole system ex existed, apart from the story with the unfit climbers in the mountaineering camp, which by the way is an anecdote, um, it is definitely for sure that in this particular camp, um, climbing competitions were organized for the first time, whether the instructors were really lazy is an anecdote I learned in the Slovenian archives. Um, but so apart from that story, mountaineers from the very beginning on um, in the Soviet Union had to struggle with securing access to limited state funding. Climbing is an expensive sport. You need equipment. You need to travel to places. Um, you need to also have the time um, to not work for a while. And the resources in the Soviet Union were devoted mostly to competitive sports um, that allowed direct competition in the international arena, right? So particularly the Olympic sports, you all know about the stories of, you know, the Cold War was also fought in the sports arena. So for the mountaineers, a way to resolve this dilemma was to organize mountaineering and climbing along the lines similar to other sports um, and professionalize it more and more. And uh, the Soviet historian Eva Mora, who has written a lot about mountaineering under Stalin, she refers to this as the self sportification of sport. But in the post war period, the immediate post war period, this was all rumors for Western climbers. They didn't, they have heard about these competitions maybe, but since 1938, no Western climber had been able to climb in the Soviet Union. And then it was only in 1953 uh, when Stalin died and an opportunity opened to climb across the curtain. For once in the Caucasus, which used to be a playing field of the European elite alpinists, but also the high Pamirs um, were really a sought after um, destination for Western climbers. So 1953 is not only the year when Stalin died, but also when Everest was first ascended by Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay. And so the Soviet 
interest in learning more about this achievement after for, for a while they ignored it, but then they were actually quite interested in um, initiated actually a new era of relationships between the West and the Soviet Union. And it led to one of the most important international friendship in Cold War climbing history. So how did this come about? In 1954, Sir John Hunt, who was not the one who ascended Everest, but he was the leader of the Everest expedition. So he was the expedition leader. He traveled to Moscow and he gave a talk uh, in front of 10 carefully vetted Soviet climbers. And one of them was this gentleman, Yevgeny Gippenreiter, or called Gip or Eugene to his international friends. And Gippenreiter, he was the archetype of the Soviet cultural mediator of the 1950s and 60s. He was smart. He was gifted, he was charming. I mean, he was so cool, just look at him. He received a degree in English from the Military Institute of Foreign Languages. And so his English was excellent. He worked as an interpreter for various sport committees um, at the All Union Sports Council. So he really also knew his way around in the international sports world. He was an avid climber himself. And so he became the secretary for international affairs of the Soviet mountaineering section that then was later called um, Soviet Mountaineering Federation. So that federation was the official all union body that was tasked with the oversight of all climbing and mountaineering related issues. Climbing was as many things in the Soviet Union quite state controlled. And reading his memoirs, um, you know, you read about John Hunt describing meeting uh, Gippenreiter as, and I quote, without the usual connotation, a case of love at first sight. And other Western mountaineers also described him as handsome and dapper, a man of great wit, endowed with a daredevil character, larger than life fellow, a Russian version of George Plimpton or perhaps Indiana Jones so perfect that he must have come from some German pre-war manufacturing operation. So these are different voices I'm quoting here. Um, and Gippenreiter is the kind of historical subject, you know, you wish you'd actually met and um, thought, oh, why wasn't I born earlier? I really would have liked to hang out with Yevgeny Gippenreiter. But what the point here is that the admiration Western mountaineers had for him really profoundly impacted their perspectives on the Soviet Union. He wasn't necessarily able to change their view on the Soviet system as a whole, but he was able to convince them that Soviet individuals were able to defy the inefficiencies inherent to the Soviet system and really make things happen. He opened opportunities for Western climbers to receive access to Soviet mountain ranges. He translated Western climbing literature, and he was a very vocal member of the international climbing community. So here are a few pictures actually with Gippenreiter and John Hunt and Soviet climbers. You see them, him always smiling uh, and engaging. And so on the one hand, these two people took the role of cultural mediators for the next two decades. And then the sports officials of the Soviet All Union Council of Sports Societies also made an effort actually to support international contacts. Um, what they did is they organized BSV Lutni Abyan. So those were currency free exchanges where sportsmen, Climbers, um, in this case, could come to the Soviet Union and they were taken care of, um, like all food and travel was covered. And then when Soviets wanted to climb um, in the West, um, they would be um, received the same treatment. And this actually existed then also with other Eastern European um, states, since there was always a problem of not being able to exchange currencies and, of course, not having enough um, a foreign currency or um, to actually fund a trip abroad. 
So this was happening um, in the late 50s and early 60s. And what was then very logical for the Soviet Mountaineering Federation as I started to open up um, to the international climbing community was to become a member of the International Mountaineering and Climbing Federation, the UIAA. So that's a French acronym and it's mostly known um, uh, with the, with that, uh, excuse me, under that acronym. The UIA was founded in 1932 and it was an umbrella organization that was actually more resembling an international tourist organization and it was really different to other sports organizations such as FIFA. And why was that so? So the UIA was a brainchild of the new East Central European nation states that emerged after World War I. Uh, and it was founded in an attempt to broaden regional modes of cross-border cooperation that had started to um, be forged in the Tatras uh, and to secure access to mountains in a fragmented Europe. So what happened is that after World War I, you had all of a sudden all these national borders crisscrossing through the mountain ranges of the former Habsburg Empire. And um, you had Polish climbers and hikers who all of a sudden you know, needed a passport to hike um, across the border to the Slovak side of the Tatra. And um, the person you see in the picture, Valery Goethel, he was one of the main um, actors in this period trying to secure, first of all, a bilateral national park in the Tatras um, that managed to alleviate um, some of these border restrictions. And he was also an international activist in nature protection in general. He was the, um, the president or chairman of the Tatra Society, uh, also a member of the actually state committee on a border questions. So he was a very active um, internationalist and he was also um, in some ways the father of the UIA. Because already before the UIA was founded in 1924, there was um, a new association created between Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, and Poland, the Association of Slavic Tourist Organizations. And this association was also there to um, facilitate exchange between um, Slavic tourists. And when I say tourists, I don't mean the tourists, you know, who go to a beach, um, but with tourists in those times, um, was meant like active hikers, not necessarily technical climbers, but people who were actively um, recreating in the mountains. And it was actually this association of Slavic tourist organizations that said, hey, we should have um, an organization like this just in, uh, on an international level. Uh, and the central role East Central European Alpine clubs played in the establishment of the UA is later important. Um, when it comes to the relationships with the Soviet Union uh, with that organization. So as I said, the UIA wasn't meant to be a governing authority of a regulated sport. Climbing wasn't regulated, um, but it was a clearinghouse for information. It facilitated international cooperation in various fields related to mountaineering, as I said, mountain access, nature protection, Later in the post-war period was also concerned with equipment safety um, and so on. And by the mid 1950s, the Soviet Union had already joined all major international sports organizations, including the International Olympic Committee. So they thought, well, no big deal to also join the UAA. But when the Soviet mountaineering section actually applied for membership in 1958, you know, with the support of the British, um, who assured that the Soviets had proven to be respectable mountaineers and excellent hosts, and were in general not very different from their Western colleagues, um, their letter to Geneva, where the, um, the headquarter of the UI was um, situated, was actually met, 
with mixed feelings from many club members of the UIA. And political and ideological reservations led to incredible eight years of debate, eight years of debate where the, the Soviet Union canon should be allowed to join the UIA. And both sides turned, to be, turned out to be extremely stubborn. And the conflict centered on two larger issues. So the first issue was the political character of the Soviet Mountaineering Federation. I'm not going to go into detail um, in, about this issue, but um, mostly, of course, about the question of whether all these mountaineers are, um, you know, ideologically, um, whether their ideology is impacting their mountaineering styles, the statute of the uh, Mountaineering Federation, of course, had a, um, a, a reference to communism, so did other Eastern European climbing federations as well, but this was all seen as a huge problem. Gittenreiter actually, you know, complained to Goethe, well, you know, just like tell the West, this is just how the country runs here, that's normal, we have to have this passism, it doesn't mean that, you know, our climbing is somehow different. Um, but so this was the one part. The second part was the Soviet practice of climbing competitions. Not all, but many Western members of the UIA were absolutely opposed to that practice. They deemed it not only risky and unethical, but climbing for them was an anti-sport and was not meant to be competitive. Of course, climbing is always competitive because being a first somewhere is, you know, per se a competitive approach to something. But um, they were mostly thinking about organized competition. The Dutch Alpine Club, for example, spoke strongly against accepting the Soviet Union into the Federation, saying that climbing competitions were against the spirit of alpinism. And this fight over the climbing competitions only ended, well, or actually the fight over the um, admittance of the Soviet Union ended only in 1966. By then, the leadership of the UI had changed, and also John Hunt, given by his friend, intervened and made a strong case to include, finally, the Soviet Federation. And so once they were a member, the sports officials lost no time to methodologically promote climbing competitions. Why? Well, because, first of all, they were convinced it's a good thing, and secondly, they were still very much interested in getting and uh, turning climbing into an Olympic sport because that would mean even more resources for their climbers. How did they do that? Well, they attended actively the UIA meetings. Here we have a picture of Yevgeny Gippenreiter and one of his um, Russian colleagues at the U uh, UIA meeting. Um, they published articles in the UIA bulletin. They reported um, about competitions at the meetings and also sent information material onto the UIA to dis disseminate it among other member states. And also they, uh, most importantly, they started inviting international representatives to their USSR climbing championships. And later even opened up the competitions to international climbers. And um, I would like to show you a short video. I will just have to stop sharing and share another. Почетными гостями были зарубежные альпинисты из 10 стран. Скала Хергиани – традиционное место состязаний по индивидуальному so лагу. Мастер um, спорта Нина sport продемонстрировала отличную технику. Трассу протяжением в 60 метров ленинградская спортсменка преодолела быстрее всех своих соперниц. And as you can see, it really drew on a lot of spectators to watch it, and it is Скалолазание – вид спорта, имеющий большое значение. The rope here comes from above, so some of you who might be climbers know this is called top roping, and it's the way how now everywhere in the world climbers learn to climb. 
And back then, this was called Russian climbing, and it was looked down upon because you couldn't really fall. You know, you would just fall into the road. Um, and this was seen back then as an absolutely no-go. And you can also see that this was really about speed. Master sport Markelov закончил состязание в рекордное время за 7 минут 57 секунд и завоевал переходящий приз имени Михаила Хергиани. Lots of spectators, so this really resembles now modern competitions, but this was absolutely unique to the Soviet Union back then. Okay, I'm going back to... This... Okay, I hope you see the right screen now. So we can just call this a charm offensive. They tried everything to, um, to promote climbing competitions and um, slowly attitudes started to change. What also started to change is that Soviet expertise now became increasingly asked for about these competitions. And in 1972, a Soviet delegation of climbers were sent to Munich at the time of the Olympic Games to demonstrate their competition methods. So a few years later, the Soviets requested from the UIA um, that their climbing competitions should be recognized, but they weren't so successful yet. Um, so there was still too much pushback from mostly Western member states against these competitions and in particularly from the American Alpine Club. Um, so Bill Putnam, who was the treasurer back then in prior, he was the president of the Alpine Club and a very important voice in mountaineering and um, in particular in the UIA, he spoke out against formalized competitions in a very heated statement in front of the UIA Executive Committee meeting in uh, 1977. And he actually brought copies of his statement in um, all UIA official languages. So in addition to English, French, and German, um, so that the committee members can take his talk um, to their home associations and discuss um, it further. And for him, competition was between, I quote, man and nature, each in the raw state and not between climbers. And how um, he really saw climbing competition as the doom to everything he believed in. And I selected one quote that in particular um, illustrates this. So he said, the literature of our sport reflects the presence of God in a way that no other form of human voluntary activity has ever done. We are unique. The introduction of formalized competition can only result in destruction of this supernatural aspect and bring on disunity and nationalistic rivalry to an extent far greater than has ever existed in the past. So this just illustrates that he really um, saw climbing doomed if formalized competitions were introduced. And it also reflects the way how people have actually thought of climbing as something um, really supernatural and not as a um, sport in terms of other uh, modern um, formalized sports. So there were also British commentators uh, on Soviet competitions who just also didn't think that, I quote, but the high level of individual freedom in the West, organized climbing competitions will gain any support for it means those who take part will be surrendering a vital component of our style of mountaineering. And the same um, commentator also mentioned um, in this like time when there were debates whether there should be competitions or, that, or not, he thought, well, everything is still in a state of flux, but it's likely that the rules accepted on the continent will, unlike Soviet speed competitions, emphasize style and difficulty. Well, as you have learned already in the beginning, um, Soviet speed competitions that are actually something very specific 
uh, made it into the three categories um, that form the sport climbing discipline um, now at the Olympics. So all this um, pushback didn't help very much. And in uh, the late 70s, with nine yes to four no votes, the UIA actually finally formed a working group that was um, tasked to study and discuss the matter of climbing competitions. Um, and in the meantime, in the Soviet Union, um, you know, I, competitions were held and even extended to ice climbing championship. Um, here are pictures from 1985. And again, you see lots of interest among spectators and or other participants um, who are watching as well. And um, the young climbers in the West, particularly in France and Italy, actually did not want to wait for the UAA to officially approve of anything. They were actually really drawn to climbing competitions and um, just organized their own ones. And the first one took place in Italy in 1985 and attracted thousands of spectators and was from then on um, organized more frequently. And then actually um, the role fell to the French in 1988-89, um, also at a time where there were other problems in the Soviet Union, to convince the UAA to recognize um, the sport climbing circuit. So there was this, um, the competitions turned in a whole circuit and the UAA then recognized these um, climbing competitions. They formed a new committee for training judges and creating competition rules. So everything that um, was really pushed back against um, in the decades before. And then in the 19, since 1990, um, artificial walls were already so prevalent that they decided to uh, organize climbing competitions only on artificial walls, um, also for matters of environmental, uh, to, to reduce environmental impact. So then climbing competitions started to include World Cups, continental championships, um, it really took off. And then eventually in 2007, a separate institution was founded, International Federation of Sport Climbing, um, that took the organized climbing out of the UIA and the UIA went back a bit to its roots to be responsible for mountaineering, but actually also ice climbing. So they were also organizing the ice, ice climbing competitions that also take place on, um, well, artificial ice or rather it's dry tooling. So you climb with ice tools on plastic walls. So um, this was the story of how the new Olympic discipline of sport climbing also contains a bit of Soviet history. And I also, uh, you know, hope that in the summer you might have some time to watch um, sport climbing uh, that is going to happen in Tokyo and think of um, the story and see that there is a little bit of Eastern Europe, a little bit of Soviet Union in many things we would not even actually think. Thank you. Thank you so much for this, Karen. This is fascinating stuff and uh, hopefully uh, uh, you, we've brought in an audience with interest both in the East European studies side of thing and maybe from the, the sports side of thing. I'd like to encourage our audience, um, uh, if you're following the Zoom webinar, you can send your questions uh, for our speaker through the Q&A function. Uh, and if you're following us on YouTube, you can send questions, um, I guess, into the, the comments area and those will be forwarded to us so we can pass them on uh, to Carolyn. I had uh, uh, one or two questions uh, right away that I was hoping maybe you could tell us a, a little bit more about. Uh, uh, Gippenreiter sounds like a fascinating figure. Of course, his last name is not very Slavic. Uh, <laughs> and there was that comment in there that he was made in a German factory. Do, do you have a little bit about his family background? Yeah, what I know that he was actually of, uh, he had a noble background, um, which makes his you know position even more interesting. Um, I think his father was a doctor, but for some reason they managed to, you know, survive the purges. Um, there are 
and there is there's never been any evidence but people have guessed that he was you know closer to certain secret services than <laughs> he would admit um but it is unclear i mean back then you know everyone had to talk and to spy but um i people were wondering about this person a lot what made him work the the system so well yeah fascinating figure i would be it would be interesting to learn more. The other thing that really intrigued me was uh, um, uh, you referred to this uh, association of Slavic tourist associations yes. from the interwar period, that's right? Yes. And um, so my big question is, um, uh, what happened after the communist takeovers in Eastern Europe? Did, uh, did mountaineering, it, to the extent that you can generalize, mm -hmm. did yeah. mountaineering in, in the countries of Eastern Europe continue <laughs> Uh, along uh, uh, the, the interwar institutional basis or were they largely Sovietized? They were, some of them were Sovietized for a few years and that's actually also when they retreated from the UIA. And then there was the time, so that was sort of the, during the time of Stalinization. Um, and they had to, the Tatra, Tatra society was actually dismantled for a few years and then later it was rebuilt and they were organized according to state lines. Um, but um, the Polish community definitely recovered and sometimes it was a renaming of associations for sure and people stayed the same. Um, but I would say that, and, and there was also, so there was a period right after the war where the contacts are pretty intense, the Pol Polish uh, mountaineers were the first one actually writing. So Valerie Goethe was the first one writing to Geneva in 45 saying, I'm alive, you know, let's revive this organization. Let's make it happen. It's as important as it was ever before. Um, and then there is some time of silence, but what really worked is that you had these, um, let's say long-term connections from the pre-war period that kept everything a bit together even though the associations changed. So there's a, basically a continuity of friendships that you see from the interwar period going um, into the post-war period. And that was really important um, to overcome this divide. Fascinating. Yeah, if I can jump in. Thank you so much, Carol. Uh, this was really interesting and engaging talk. Um, my question is like, is there a difference between calling uh, climbing as climbing and calling it a sport? Because sport as such does include this competitiveness as a category. So was that difference important both in the West and uh, Soviet Union and Eastern Europe as well? Yeah, so this is an interesting question. And there is a very, um, I was actually, you know, looking into the roots of when climbing was called a sport or not. And um, I found a, um, so the badminton library of sports and pastimes, that's like a British, you know, handbook on, on sports. Um, and in addition from the, I think 1892 or so, it, it doesn't, it, it includes climbing. It doesn't say yet yeah, it's what it says. Um, so the point, um, the point in time when climbing was a recreational, became a recreational activity was when not everyone felt that he had to write a book after he scaled a mountain. I think that was very nicely put already in the late 19th century. Um, and there is definitely also around the turn of the century, you have already German alpinists um, talking about the sports debate, is this a sport, is it not a debate, and which actually which kind of definition of sport should we use to describe this. Um, so there, there are definitely, let's say, different kind of views on that. Um, there is also that tradition of calling it actually tourism, and in this, particularly in the Slavic world, calling the mountaineers actually um, to, uh, touristi. Um, and this is this kind of, you know, active tourism actually prior to what we think of, of tourism. Um, so long story short, what we do see is that there is a move towards more athleticism. And I think that is also, that's a development that 
sort of from the old mountaineering where people actually try to go the easiest way to let's make it harder and become more athletic. The body becomes much more important than these elevated, you know, feelings of connecting to something divine. Um, so there's that also going along where people are very comfortable in calling it a sport. Thank you. Yeah. Chris, you wanted maybe. Yeah, we, we have some questions coming in from the audience that I would mm -hmm. like to transmit. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, our audience member says, thank you for this lecture. While my climbing gym is closed, it is nice to, to a talk about climbing, at least. I think probably a lot of people share that sentiment. Uh, but this person goes on, says, as a gender historian, I wanted to ask about the gendered nature of Soviet climbing. To what extent was it excluding non-dominant masculinities as we are still witnessing today? Also, when did Soviet women join the climbing communities more? Were there ideological pushes to see more women climbing? Or were women, women just a fascinating rarity like in the Wysotsky song, Skalalaska from 1966? <laughs> okay. um, so there may be Two answers to that. So one is um, Soviet mountaineering and the tragedy of female mountaineers um, in the Soviet Union, which is um, connected to the 1974 tragedy of the international mountaineering camp. So in 1974, the strongest um, female climbers of the Soviet Union uh, planned a traverse on Peak Lenin um, at the same time where the Soviet Union had invited for the first time international climbers from the West, the, the, um, the USA and all over. And the whole 1974 camp turned into a tragedy. Um, there was an avalanche and a storm. People died and American died and the entire Soviet um, female mountaineering team was wiped out. So eight women died on Peak Lenin. And it was also, so it, it wasn't discussed. I mean, there was a movie about it, but it wasn't so much discussed in the Soviet Union, but one of the American climbers was a New York Times journalist. So he also wrote a New York Times about it. And of course a question came, um, exactly that question of gender came up, right? Is there something particularly about Soviet female mountaineers that they push more and longer? Um, the Soviets actually, prohibited all female teams after that tragedy. Um, but of course, there was also a question, you know, who, who's our, who are our top climbers now as all these um, women had died. Um, there is a recent article um, on gender and climbing uh, just by Eva Maura, just, it just came out a while ago. Actually, I have not looked at it yet. Um, so it is a, is a continuing question actually also for the archives to understand how gender worked um, in, um, in the Soviet climbing um, community. Um, in terms of sport climbing, there's also, you know, there's at least a lot of footage and also um, women did take um, part in these rock climbing competitions. It seems to be a pretty equally, you know, a pretty equal thing because also rock climbing just didn't, you know, it requires different skills um, and is definitely not as deadly as mountaineering. So there is then also a shift in, you know, where you put the focus um, of this uh, gendered, very gendered sport. Fascinating, thank you. Um, uh, a sort of a personal question from one of our audience members. How did you first become interested in this topic? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I wrote my dissertation on this. That's the question of like, how did I get my dissertation topic? I, um, I think it started all with Slovenia and environmental protection in Slovenia and me living in Slovenia and wanting to climb mountains, not having anyone to do it, keeping on working in nature protection, realizing that lots of mountaineers were involved in, in nature protection. So actually I got from nature protection in the Alps to Alpine clubs and at the same time, I arrived in Boston as a grad student with nothing to do and joined the mountaineering club and thought I would like hike mountains. And all of a sudden, I you know, started climbing some rock walls in New Hampshire. And so everything just came together, my private life and you know, my dissertation topic developing. And so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we, Fair short story for a long story. You've got the snowball metaphor working. Yeah. That's nice. <laughs> um, 
Another question from our audience. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, coming from a background of interest in Polish mountaineering, uh, I'm less familiar with the Soviet case. Was there ever, uh, either in the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union, a history of climbing that put a premium on the aesthetics of mountaineering as opposed to the competitive sport aspects of it? And if so, uh, what happened to that tradition? <laughs> Ah, first of all, hello, Patrice. Nice to not see you, but read, read from you. Um, the statics of mountaineering. Uh, I would say yes. I actually, I don't think the tradition is there and as rooted as in Western mountaineering that started from the aesthetics. Um, there is a lot about camaraderie. Um, it, it becomes quite quickly also about, you know, mass mountaineering, about technicalities, but I, I'm not entirely, I, I don't want to say that what there wasn't, there wasn't any. Mm -hmm. If I can like take it from there, uh, maybe, Maybe like if this question is reformulated instead of aesthetics to think about this monitoring style, uh, uh, like the style of um, uh, that you mentioned, I think it was a, a, a topic around these political debates, um, debates about or issues about politics. Yeah, so styles definitely differed, um, but there was also, in terms, for example, of emphasis, like do you have an emphasis on safety and terms of outside control? That's what, you know, the Soviet Union, they had these return, you had to have a route um, approved and then you had certain return times were strict and you had to radio in. There was a lot of technology involved. That's what Western climbers thought, like that's a no-no. Um, so style is always something very subjective and there were definitely, um, and that's what is actually interesting to see is that as um, the more it gets into the technicalities, the more climbers also overcome this idea that there was some sort of political layer on top, right? And of course, it's very easy to say, to say, oh yeah, they do this because it's very communist to do this and that. Um, but the more it was about actual climbing, um, the more it was just a matter of, let's say, sports styles. Um, and there was a recognition that they do things differently. But that was actually not very different to um, Western mountaineers. I mean, the the British style of climbing and the German and the Italian, they have, you know, um, fought over whether you're allowed to use pitons or not and, and those kinds of things and um, whether the leader should fall or not. So this is just a, it's a very natural part of a sport evolving, but it was very often couched in national terms. So it was, you know, German style versus um, British style already in the interwar period. So there's, there are definitely these national layers on top. Another question from Timothy Noonan. Thanks for the talk. Uh, the question, did defectors or migrants from the USSR and Eastern Europe play any role in the transformation of Western climbing? It seems like the story here is one of competitions and the Soviet desire for international recognition that was driving changes. Uh, be curious what factors here make mountaineering different from say gymnastics where the Romanians changed US practice. Did any of your figures make their careers in Western Europe or the US after 1989, 1991? Hi Tim. Mm -hmm. um, did they remake their careers? Um, well, I think the difference is that with climbing, you climb internationally, right? So you basically go to a mountain where it is. So you don't necessarily remake, if I understand your question correctly, you don't necessarily remake your career in the West, but you go, you know, regardless, if, if you're Russian and you go and climb in Afghanistan, that's sort of your where you can remake your career. I don't know if, if that makes sense. Um, um, so, sorry, I'm just like trying to 
understand. So, um, I mean, changes were definitely... What you see now is a very strong Russian dominance in certain categories like ice climbing and speed climbing. So those were actually also disciplines. They were, you know, the speed climbing that they invented, which as such just means that there's probably more support for it or more interest in it. Um, but yeah, defectors, I can't think of any defectors or migrants actually that came. Uh, uh, Misha Apeltova had a, a, a couple of questions. I think you partly answered the first one in, in your response just now as to the, the main distinction between the, the Soviet uh, or Eastern European style as opposed to Western style. But if you had any other comments about that, you could add. But I like the second part of her questions. Uh, climbing and mountaineering is such a white sport. <laughs> to what extent is this, uh, particularly in the Soviet Union, a Russian sport? To what extent do people from the other Soviet republics participate? Uh, what can climbing and mountaineering tell us about ethnic and national relations in the Soviet bloc? Um, yeah, thanks for that uh, question. It definitely was a white sport in the Soviet Union as well. Um, they were, I think, in the very beginning, um, a few attempts to, you know, bring alpinism to um, other republics. Very little interest, also particularly in the mountain, um, uh, among the people living in the mountains. And, you know, it is a very urban sport and you really need a good reason to risk your life for, <laughs> for nothing. Um, uh, there is there's a special history of Georgian mountaineering that is definitely was you know very successful. Of course, Georgia has um, also um, on the one hand it had the landscape were in some imperial way Western climbers um, uh, projected their exploratory um, desires um, once everything else was climbed in the Alps. Um, but the Georgians climbed um, a lot themselves, and there and that's some. I don't I actually don't recall if it's if I'm working on them, but there has definitely been research done in this very particular Georgian, um, how the Georgian Climbing Federation also, um, you know, tried to stay separate and do the, do their own things, and how um, national um, uh, attentions um, arose in that um, between Georgian and, and Russian climbers. Otherwise. Uh, the climbing, the mountaineering camps in the Pamirs, the um, uh, Kyrgyz and Tajik people around were more like, you know, staging the environment. And of course, yes, they invited the international climbers for tea in the yurts, but it was more like a really um, like added folklore. And there was no actual agency, I think these people had in uh, over there, actually, you know, pastures where the climbing camp then was put um, or anything. There are some interesting pictures from that time where you see the mountaineering, the Soviet mountaineering officials all in their, um, well, sports gear and down jackets and the, um, the Tajik officials in their suits the very Soviet suits. So there's already that distinction between, you know, sport is something that Russians do um, and not local people. Uh, slightly related question here. Uh, uh, someone asks, it, this might be a bit out of scope, but I wonder if the Sokol movement, that is, of course, the Czech nationalist uh, uh, sports mm. clubs, uh, it could have played a role in developing climbing as a sport. And I wonder if, you know, of course, Central and Eastern Europe has a, a whole series of these nationally oriented right. sports clubs. Did, did they play a role in developing climbing? Um, the Sokols, not so much. Definitely, of course, for the history of sport, yes, and athleticism. But um, the cl climbing was really a part because it is rooted in this mountaineering um, and alpine tradition. It was really located more within the the actual alpine clubs. And of course, not every member of an alpine club climbed, some just hiked or like mountains, but um, there, was that, there was that distinction. Lovely. Well, thank you so much. I, I know that it's getting rather late in Germany uh, where you're checking in from, <laughs> okay. uh, Caroline. 
So maybe we can wind this up here, but uh, hopefully, uh, well, I'm, I'm sure that your talk has given everyone who attended uh, 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 curiosity about the other things that you'll be doing when you, you come to New York uh, later this spring. We call it the summer term, but it's really just yes. uh, coming up in a few weeks. Uh, so of course, we're looking forward to having you here and, and to all the things that you're gonna do while you're here. Um, so uh, any other comments or questions on your side, Sasha? Yeah, um, maybe before we just part, I, I had a question. I don't know from my experience from former Yugoslavia how alpine sports helped a lot of, you know, apparel industry. Um, were you like tracing any sort of that um, throughout your research or that was kind of like a side topic? Um, you mean equipment in general or yes. clothing? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it was a bit of a side topic, but something very interested because I get more and more interested in actually uh, material history. And um, in the Eastern Bloc, for sure, a lot of things were homemade. So, you know, you had to rip, um, uh, rip open a, down, a duvet and make your down jacket with that. And there were a few in the GDR. There is actually a famous example of a company called Yeti that, you know, developed from one of those people making or one of those home enterprises making um, down jackets. Um, there is also, um, there are interesting, let's say, elements coming from the Soviet Union, for example, um, ice screws, I think carbon, uh, not carbon, it's carbon ice screws. Um, that were very, that the Soviet um, climbers had access to because a lot of them were engineers. So they had access to, um, to materials a Western climber didn't, you know, and then they would make their own equipment. And that again was traded for something else. The inter interlocutors of all were the Polish climbers who had access to French um, clothing and helmets and were always a bit fancier than the Russians ones. And so it was definitely a marketplace of, you know, who had the best equipment and so on. And there are lots of stories. Um, actually, I'm just um, co-editing a special issue for the International um, Journal of Sports History about um, sports equipment. So there's still a lot, lot of things to be explored also in the clothing sector. Well, yeah, thank you. This, this is really interesting and kind of refreshing research that you have. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me in real life very soon. <laughs> yeah. I can't believe it. It's happening. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Thank you again. And um, I just will use the opportunity to say maybe uh, something just to announce our next event, um, which I actually have to pull out. Uh, Chris, if you have it handy, maybe that's also. <laughs> uh, you'll probably pull it up faster than I will. Um, okay. This is next Wednesday. Um, next Tuesday, we will Actually, have. Um, um, we have a, a series, um, a lecture series on um, avant-garde um, art from uh, Eastern Europe. And um, our next uh, talk um, will be uh, next Tuesday at 4 p.m. Uh, by uh, Michalina Kmejcik, um, a talk on uh, Katarina uh, Kobro and Devota Volgels uh, as composers of space. Uh, so maybe for all of those who are interested in, in that topic, um, just to say what's coming next. Okay, yeah, great. And you can always check, uh, check the events calendar for the Harriman Institute at Columbia. All of our events will be posted there. Thanks for joining us today, everyone.